Are we go ready? Ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Katie Wright, and I am the president of HLAA California. I live in smoky Southern California, even though I'm not near the fires, but I'd like to welcome you all to this virtual meeting featuring Barbara Kelly, the executive director of HLAA. HLAA California has been active since June, meeting with our statewide chapter leaders, weekly at first and now bike weekly, although our virtual meeting committee has been weeking, meeting every Friday since we decided to take this idea and run with it. The discussions that we've had have centered around how to stay connected and to improve our tech skills. We've all needed, all of us have needed a lot of help with that. <laughs> the best part, the best parts have been sharing ideas of presentations and being able to put names to faces. Faces to names? Faces to names. Yes, faces to names. Out of our discussion came the idea to have an all California meeting to support the chapters that are struggling and not able to do Zoom meetings on their own. So when we decided that we would like Barbara Kelly to talk to us way out here on the West, on the Coast, West Coast, we contacted HLAA. And when we all put our heads together virtually, we decided it would be invaluable. Valuable. It would be invaluable for Barbara to talk to all of us, not just California. So here we are. First on our agenda is going to be our tech tips from Ann Thomas. Ann wears many hats in HLAA. She's the HLAA brand ambassador. She's the president of HLAA Diablo Valley here in California. She's a committee member of Get in the Hearing Loop. And she's our go-to person for ideas and tech advice. Ann, take it away. Thanks. Carla, can you bring up the slides? Next slide, please. Hi, everybody. Here we are, yay. For those of you who have been Zooming. Oh, I'm getting a little audio. I just, I just ask all the participants to please mute themselves because if your microphone is on, it will cause a lot of feedback. So I have muted everyone at this point. So hopefully we won't have any more feedback. Okay. Hold on, Ann. You're on mute. You're on mute. There you go. Okay. For those of you who've been Zooming along for a while, our directions and tips may be old hat for you, but we may have new people here today who aren't really quite comfortable with how to use Zoom and how to use all the directions and the special features that are part of this platform. Our desire is for you to come up to speed with Zoom and have it become a part of your life. Next slide, please, Carla. There are some Zoom preferences and options that everybody needs to know how to utilize. Obviously, captions are number one. Also, how to look at a full transcript, to use the chat window, and raise your hand. Next slide, please. If all of you look at the bottom of your Zoom window, you'll see a menu cross bar across the bottom that looks like this. Only the hosts can activate closed captions. Once they have activated closed captions, the closed caption icon will show up on your menu bar. So sometimes people start a meeting and they don't see it. Well, it's because it hasn't been turned on yet. So once the host turns on the closed captions, you see the CC icon and you can see the circle around it. And when you click on that icon, you have several options. The first and most important option is to click on subtitles to activate them 
for the Zoom windows. Now you also have the option, yeah, Carla, if you can do that, if you can point to that, that'd be great. I saw your cursor move. So another way, you also have um, two options as to viewing um, the um, transcripts in different ways. One of them is the font size. So you can increase the font size or decrease the font size by clicking on the video icon in the bottom right hand corner or next slide, Carla. This may be the easiest. Click on your CC icon again, and there are three options in there. Click on subtitle settings and you can adjust the size of the fonts. Next size, please. You also can view the full transcript. If you're in the CC icon window is an option to view full transcript. Note that if you're in full screen mode, you can't use that. So I'm never in full screen mode. There's also another option, which I actually prefer because I have a bigger window. Next slide, please. And that's to view it as a full screen in a separate web browser window. So you would open up your web browser simultaneously while Zoom is going. On my computer, I see them side by side. You paste the URL, which we pasted when we started in the chat window. If you scroll, if you wanted to do this, if you scroll up to the chat window, it's the first thing in the menu. You would copy that, paste it into the address bar in a new web browser and your stream text will start running on the side. Next slide, please. The chat window, people have already been asking about that. So the chat window is in the menu bar at the bottom of your screen. You can see here on this slide, it has a circle around it. Everybody has to open the chat window. If you don't open the chat window, anytime somebody chats there, it bounces up and interferes with the captions. So once you open the chat window, another window is gonna open up and that will not happen for the meeting. Now, normally you can just move that window around anywhere you want it on your screen. Occasionally it's locked. If by some chance it's locked at the top of the menu where you clicked on the uh, open the chat window, you'll see what looks like the chat with a down arrow like this. When you click on that down arrow, there's an option and it says pop out. If you click on that, it will unlock your, your uh, chat window and you can move it around anywhere on the screen. And obviously we we'll wanna move it away from the presentation window so that it doesn't interfere with the captions. Next slide, please. We would like everybody to feel free to use the chat window to help others. So obviously what happens is we're giving the directions and the tips and people are coming in later. And so something that they needed to know, we've already talked about. So if they have a question about that and somebody sees it in the chat window and you really know the answer to that, even though we have numerous people monitoring the chat to help everybody, please feel free to comment or ask a technical question if you're stuck with something. We'd like to ask that um, you identify maybe where your name comes up so we get to see who it's from. Um, but you might want to put who your, where your location is. You might want to put California or Washington or the name of your chapter. Next slide, please. This is the most important thing for Q&A. You can imagine, I'm looking right now, we have 211 people here. If we didn't have some system to be able to identify who wanted to ask a question, it would be chaos. So the way that you ask a question is through the raise the hand feature and it's located in the participants and you can see it has the circle around it. When you click on the participants, there is a raise the hand option in the bottom right hand corner. Next slide, please. And it looks like this. 
So the image on the left shows what the participants window looks like when no one has raised their hand. And you can see in the bottom right hand corner, you have the hand. The sample on the right shows someone who has raised their hand. It gets a box around it. And next to that person's name is a hand. Also for the hosts and co-hosts on the thumbnail picture in your galley view, a blue hand shows up so it's easy to identify who is asking a question. You can imagine how much better this makes it. Next slide, please. Now, this is something we all crave, but if you're like me, when I get excited or nervous, I speak faster. <laughs> so for all of us, and if I am speaking too fast, nudge me in the chat. We all have to speak slower so it makes it easier for everybody to understand. And it also makes it easier for the captioner to caption accurately, because you can imagine how stressful it is hearing people who are talking really fast. Next slide, please. If you don't have an external microphone, I highly recommend that you add it to your list of things to get. It improves the audio clarity for everybody on a Zoom call exponentially. And all of us like to use as much as we possibly can of our audio capability as long as we can. So put it on your to-do list. That's it. Back to Katie. Thank you, Anne, very much. I already blew it on my timeline. Carla, we were supposed to do the first poll. Would you do it, please? Oh. <laughs> Everybody, oh, Carla, you wanna do it? You're muted. Okay. Uh, the poll is asking, where are you joining us from today? What region, west, mountain, central, east, or outside of the US? Okay. Okay, most of our friends are from the West and the East today. So. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. All righty. Okay, let me, um, okay, move a bit. All right, now, now for the main purpose from where, why we are here today, I'd like to introduce you to Barbara Kelly. Barbara became executive director of HLAA in March of 2016. She was first hired by Rocky Stone himself in 1988. So she's been involved in our organization for over 30 years. Rising up through the ranks, she has made it her life's work to contribute to the mission of HLAA. In her words, I'm energized by our members and supporters whose dedication to HLAA is unwavering. When we invited her to be our guest speaker, she did not hesitate to say yes, giving proof to her words. Please welcome Barbara Kelly. Thank you, Katie. Um, it is really my pleasure and honor to be here. And uh, California State Association named my talk today called A Conversation with Barbara Kelly. And I really hope this is a conversation. And I thought that I would invite you into my family room. And this is where my family gathers to um, enjoy each other and to chat and to uh, watch a movie and play Boggle. And so I'm just happy to have you all here. But my heart goes out to everybody on the West Coast because I know that you are dealing with those terrible fires and the smoke and we hear the news and uh, we just want you to know that, that we're with you. Um, I'll just start. I, here's, um, I wanna ask a question. Without HLAA, who would be the voice for people with hearing loss at the national level. Without HLAA, who would represent people who want to stay in the hearing world with technology? I think you know the answer to that question. 
the workload here is formidable, but the good we've done for more than 40 years with all of you is really inspiring. And all along the way, we've stuck to the mission. And our mission, of course, is to open the world of communication to people with hearing loss through, by providing information, education, support, and advocacy. And this is actually a picture of our new office. We just moved recently, and this is our reception area. So you're the first to see it. I'm gonna talk a little bit about our structure because I don't wanna assume that everybody knows about our organization, and maybe some of you know this, but we'll just we'll try to cover a lot of things today, and then we'll have time for captions. In fact, I'm gonna put my timer on right now. All right. All right, Carla told me. There we go. This is our board of directors. And our board of directors is all volunteer and they come from all across the country and they come to meetings, they, they come at their own expense, they volunteer their time and their function is governance. This is a legal function of nonprofits. And the board of directors determines our mission and they ask all the time, are we still doing our mission? Uh, are we accomplishing our mission? Do our programs support our mission? They also have the financial responsibility and they approve the budget. The board of directors also hires an outside auditor every year to audit our financial records to make sure that we're spending uh, the donations that we get properly and we have the right amount of proportion for programs and administrative costs. So this is a really important responsibility and the board provides oversight and they set policy and they do things like make decisions on uh, how much we keep in reserve in our investments. Then we have the staff and we are at the HLA headquarters uh, in Rockville, Maryland. And some of our staff are full-time, some are hired as consultants, some are part-time, but here's our staff. And we also have volunteers uh, when we were in the office before COVID who come regularly to the office. We have Hollis Goodman, who um, helps on all fronts in the office, administrative duties. And she actually is here today helping me in the other room. That's why I heard the sound. We also have Barry Kassinitz, who volunteers for us. And he is our professional advisor for public policy. And he does a lot of work with Lisa Hamlin, our director of public policy. And we also have another volunteer very interesting man, his name is David Gale, and he's a retired attorney from NASA. And he also works on public policy. And as you know, um, HLA, part of our mission is advocacy and public policy work at the national level. So I also work on public policy. So we have a really solid team there, two of which are volunteers and Barry, is a former board of directors uh, person, and he is also a retired lobbyist. So here is your staff. Maybe you recognize all of these smiling faces. Then we have the state associations and chapters, and that is you. And I, I love this picture because um, I tried to get some pictures from California, and there you see Catherine Burns, who has passed away, and I know she was a favorite of many of you, and of course, the amazing Grace Thiessen, who is sitting there in the middle. And I just think this is a fantastic picture. And then after the state associations and chapters, we have our members, our donors, our corporate partners, our Walk for Hearing participants, our supporters. So we have a large community of people who are in touch with HLAA in one way or the other. So at the national office, we don't do the work alone. You are the grassroots force for change. The HLA mission is fully alive in our chapters and in our state associations, providing information, education. Um, a lot of you do advocacy work at the local level and you give that 
all important peer-to-peer -peer support. So we'll talk more about advocacy later, but you are part of the work that we all do at HLAA. Of course, anything we were doing in January of this year is not what we're doing in September of this year. I call this the pandemic pivot. And COVID accelerated changes for HLAA. The pandemic forced us into this virtual reality that Katie was talking about and all the positive things that came about that we've gotten to see people face to face and connect with people across the country. And we quickly had to pivot to offer things virtually and digitally. So we quickly created resources on our website. We realize and we wanted you to realize that your civil rights don't disappear just because there is a global health crisis. Because you might be in a health emergency, you've had new challenges, you've had to work from home, you've had to take courses online, and or you might find yourself in a medical situation where you still need communication access. Of course, face masks became a really hot button issue. We held a webinar on, fa on face masks, which is available for playback on our website. And we joined with the American Speech Language Hearing Association and urged the CDC to put something on their website to make people aware that there are clear face masks and it could be an alternative to um, one that completely shuts off communication for even people with mild hearing loss who depend on visual cues. And of course we know the sound is muffled. So the CDC did that. And of course, then we sent another communique to thank them. But face masks are really fraught with a lot of problems because the clear face masks aren't approved in medical situations as protective gear. So you're not likely to see them in hospitals or your doctor wearing them. So until that happens, and we hope that it does, and we're working for that. But we also know that the NIDCD was very inspired by the work of HLAA and by the information we put out, that they also put some information out. And they told us that. They said that they were inspired by us to spread the word. We also partnered with a company called Cricket, who is a company that makes uh, crafting materials. And we had crafters from across the country who donated their version of clear face masks and they were really varying in how they came across. And we offered them for free to people and they blew off the shelves and they were free. They had different uh, standards and varieties, but I just think all of this is working toward that awareness that something that is going to be with us for a while is really a communication problem. So beginning in March 15th, to be exact, we adapted much of what we do to online platforms that we delivered right to your laptops, your desktops, your iPads, and your smartphones. And I am so pleased to say that all our offerings, all our events were free with captions. And while most people will shelter, sheltering at home, our chapter and state leaders took steps to keep people engaged and connected. And we found this really um, awe-inspiring and very motivating. And many of you are on social media. And we found that one person's post or a question would lead to further conversations, which would lead to new ideas. But in the end, it was just a lot of support in keeping the community together. And yes, there were pain points with this technology, right? But I think as Katie was saying and Beth Wilson was saying that it really has been fun being able to join a meeting across the country. So that's just some of the things that we did. We had to cancel our convention this year, but we had a 
a mini conference, Experience HLAA, and we had 2,400 people register for that event. So this is just uh, some of the things that we did in what I call HLAA's virtual reality. Let's go back to advocacy. You know, the work that chapters and state organizations are doing in the community is so important. And some people ask, what is advocacy? What is an advocate? Well, I pulled together some words that I thought describes you individually or you as a chapter or you as a state association. I think being an advocate shows independence. It shows confidence. It's a very person-centered approach because you're trying to make a change usually for people where it matters. Being an advocate is showing empowerment and feeling empowerment. Being an advocate is about equal opportunity and it's about accountability. So I thought these, these were all really positive, positive words. And I, I want to applaud all of you. Some of the states are working on telecoil laws and loop laws. And originally our state associations and state organizations were formed because you needed an entity in your state. You had a lot of active chapters, but when you went to your state capital, they would be like, well, who are you? But when you can say, we are the California State Association, that makes a difference. So I just wanna thank people across the country, whether you've worked with an HLA chapter or state association, or maybe you've just gone on your own and you've asked for captions, or you asked for something to make your life easier in the workplace. I really need to pat yourself on the backs. Then at the national level, since 1979, we've been advocating for all people with hearing loss in the United States, and that's currently 48 million people. It doesn't matter if you've joined HLAA or you a donor or a supporter, we work for all people with hearing loss. That's what we do. Um, we do it in a formal uh, way with public policy, and we also do it with our phone calls and emails. No matter who calls up, somebody's getting discriminated in the workplace, we'll help you. That's what we do. And um, I think that we can all feel really good about that. So I know you want me to talk about some of the things that are happening at the national level and I can't cover them all, but let's run through a couple things and maybe they'll inspire some questions. First of all, we, we worked with our COVID-19 resources and we're working on the um, American Association of People with Disabilities Accessibility Project. And we work on these COVID-19 resources as we have on other issues with coalition groups. We are member of the Friends of the Congressional Hearing Health Caucus. Um, I was just appointed chair of that caucus and there is a U.S. Congressional Hearing Health Caucus. It's chaired by Representative McKinley, and it's also co-chaired by your representative, um, Mike Thomas, from the 5th District in California. This is going to be really important because Medicare is going to come back on the radar. Um, we work at the FCC. Lisa Hamlin, the Director of Public Policy, is on the Disability Advisory Committee. I'm her alternate if she can't show up. And we deal with a lot of uh, captioning issues, telecommunication issues. We work with the Transportation Security Administration, the Department of Transportation on accessible travel. And right now we've just been invited to serve on the airport accessibility project with open doors. And I love these pictures because there's a picture of Barry Kassinitz and there is one of your own, your own Californians, Meg Walhagen. And she's a former board of directors chair of HLAA. And she comes to Washington a lot and she just happened to be there when we were down on Capitol Hill working on the over the counter Hearing Aid Act. So I just, I love that picture. She's one of yours, California. 
So what does Carla want? Now this is, this is our own Carla here. What does Carla want? You know what she wants. She wants to be able to take her cell phone and put it up to her ear and hear, just like everybody else does. We are working on the hearing aid compatible task force. And this is um, when digital phones first appeared in the 1990s. HLA was there to make sure that the phones worked with hearing aids. Still today, there's a good chance that you could leave that store and it still doesn't work with hearing aids. And have you tried to test a phone in the store lately? It's either tethered to a block, right? Or there's no live line. So HLAA is working with industry to see if there's a way that cell phones can become all 100% compatible. And this was inspired and urged by the FCC to set up this task force to see if this could happen. We will be asking for your input at some point uh, for some information that we will use, that industry will use. So stay tuned for a survey. I wanna go back to advocacy just for a minute because many of you have been asking whatever happened to the Over-the-Counter Hearing Aid Act. And this was one of the recommendations from the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine that the FDA open up a new category of over-the-counter hearing aids for adults with mild to moderate hearing loss. Uh, three years ago, in August 2017, the law was passed. We are just now waiting for the FDA to write the proposed rules. And they really don't have a deadline. And um, we have been trying to stay tuned, but the regulations need to be written. And when the proposed rules are, you can all respond to those as individuals, but HLA will make a response that's really consumer oriented to make sure the devices are safe, that they work, that, that you can return them and there's warnings on them. So that's just some of the things that we're working on. And by now we know what Carla wants, right? And my next slide isn't going, so here we go. Another one of our, our programs is um, HLA Communications Access is the Get in the Hearing Loop program is fueled by passionate, volunteers coast to coast and they are dedicated to promoting educating advocating about communication access with hearing loops juliet sturkins is the hlaa professional advisor for hearing loops and this program is funded by a grant from the david and carol myers foundation but uh, Katie mentioned that Ann Thomas is on this committee and many of you on this meeting today are on the committee. And most recently, they filed comments with the US Access Board for loops in rail cars. On our website, hearingloss.org, there is a beautiful comprehensive toolkit with materials that you can download. You'll really be delighted to see what this committee has produced. So please check that out. This is um, something very exciting. I know many of you uh, have cochlear implants. There was just a survey done uh, with an outside company um, not involved with cochlear implants that many of you might have filled out. It was in the past couple months that ran from our e-news. And they found out that of the 731 people who responded to the survey, 21% of you had a cochlear implant. That is extraordinarily high in the United States because of all the people in the United States who could benefit from a cochlear implant, only 5% get one. Believe it or not, there's not a lot of awareness of cochlear implants. There's not a lot of audiologists and ENTs who are referring for cochlear implants. And those of you who have them are probably saying, why not? 
We also know that there are no standards of care where there were no standards of care for cochlear implants. So the Hearing Loss Association was asked to take part in an international consensus paper on adult cochlear implantation. And this was a new study that focused on treatment for adults living with severe to profound sensory neural hearing loss. And part of that group was the Consumer and Professional Advisory Committee. And I served as the US co-chair along with Dr. Harold Seidler, who was the other co-chair from Germany, who is a CI surgeon and a CI wearer. And our committee's charge was to ensure that the consumer voice was heard. Well, a couple weeks ago, these, this consensus paper and the seven categories of standards of care was published in the Journal of American Medicine Otolaryngology. So it's a really important study because it brings awareness to cochlear implants and its relevance, and it gives advocates even some information. So we were really pleased to be part of that. It was authored by 31 hearing experts on cochlear implant treatment, and it's really an authoritative call to policymakers, funding bodies, and health professionals who need to learn to refer for cochlear implants. We're going to have an upcoming webinar on this paper, and on September 29th, I think it's about Carla shaking her head, please look for it. Dr. Craig Buckman from Washington University in St. Louis will be uh, the speaker along with Renee Gifford, Dr. Renee Gifford from um, uh, Nashville will also be there. And they were two of the people integral in leading the study. In fact, Professor Buckman was chair. So please, please join that. And of course, Walk for Hearing is one of our major awareness and fundraising programs. And this is where we really see the families. We see the kids with hearing aids and cochlear implants and the parents and people of all ages coming out and having fun. And here we have San Diego and we have Long Beach and we wanna give a shout out to the Bay Area because their walk along with all our fall walks were virtual this year. So thank you everybody who's involved in those walks across the country. They really are a lot of fun and this year we partnered with American Girl, whose doll of the year is Joss, and she wears a hearing aid. So the fun part is, is that American Girl came to us. They found HLAA and, because they felt that we were the organization for people with hearing loss. They could have chosen many other organizations but you cannot believe the excitement when we got the call from American Girl. I mean, just imagine. But you can be very proud of that. You are all part of that. You're all part of this work. And that's it. Our reputation is so good. And embrace that. Pat yourselves on the back because your work is all part of that. It's not just what we do at the national level. And it's also global. I mean, it really is a small world. The HLAA is now a member of the World Health Organization World Hearing Forum. And here is Lisa Hamlin, our Director of Public Policy, and myself in Geneva last year at the WHO for the World Hearing Forum. And they will be coming out with their global report on hearing loss on World Hearing Day on March 3rd. So that's going to be a really important report. And HLAA is part of this. We, we are not only respected here in the United States, but across the world. So here we're gonna go to, from Geneva, and we're gonna hop over to Denmark. Uh, last year, the Person-Centered Health Network was formed 
and it is made up of academia, usually audiology, uh, professors and students. It's made up of professional organizations like ASHA, and it's what it's also made up of what the Ida Institute calls patient organizations like HLAA. And HLAA is the only patient organization chosen from North America to be part of this group. And we have worked for the past year on some very exciting things, all dealing with person-centered care that we're gonna be rolling out in October. And some of you here may have been involved in previous Ida Institute um, hearing journey groups, and there's some coming up, which now will be virtual, not in person, but it's really important that we are involved globally. And it's really exciting that when they think of organizations they wanna partner with, they think of HLAA. And again, I just wanna thank you. You're, you're part of that work, you're part of our reputation, and we couldn't do it without you. This is very exciting. It's our new technology program. It's called uh, the Industry and Consumer Alliance for Accessibility and Technology. And it's funded by the US Department of Health and Human Services. We're a subcontractor with Gallaudet's Research Engineering and Rehabilitation Center. And we've got some heavy hitters heading this up. We have our technology advisor, who is Linda Cosmos Vitek, who's a research, senior research audiologist at Gallaudet, who's, who's the Gallaudet lead. We have Lisa Hamlin from our staff, who is the HLA lead. And the grant has provided us to hire a part-time consultant for this project. And her name is Kathy Metier. And that is, she is also part of the, the program. We are also partnered with the American Institutes of Rehabilitation on this. And you can see here that the vision is to create a community where people with hearing loss and hearing assistive technology can collaborate together for mutual benefit. And we see uh, some of the services design consultation for accessibility. So when products are being baked, that communication access is in there and not something as a retrofit or an afterthought down the road. We hope to have a tested, a trusted tester program, a product review, and we are in the first grant year of this. And we're going to call in some of our NCHAT trainers uh, for like a focus group and webinar. And that was our other five-year technology program that just ended. So we hope to make this program at the end of five years sustainable. And it, I'm hoping that it could be the seeds of a bigger technology project for HLAA. And as we all know, our community are technology users, right? Here we have our own HLA people. I love this picture. That is Kay Tyberg right in the middle from Pennsylvania. And we are people who want to stay in the hearing world with technology. So it's very important that we have programs that support that. We also, you know, we can't do things alone. We work in partnerships with many organizations and we have a huge public service campaign announcement that's been going on called Hear Well and Stay Vital. And if you look at the organizations down at the bottom, those are the people that we're partnering with. The Hearing Industries Association funded these beautiful PSAs and they're totally non-branded. They've been playing in markets across the country. And as far as the Nielsen rating goes, last year, it was number seven in PSAs of Nielsen ratings for abuse. It's a beautiful campaign and you can go on our website and you can all use this. You can all grab some social media snippets. You can grab the PSAs, you can post them on Facebook and we invite you to use them. This is for all of us to create awareness with hearing loss. So sometimes when we can't do something by ourselves, we try to find common ground where we can work with other organizations and it's really a lot of fun 
to work with um, these organizations. It really is. Whoops. If you want to know more about us, our annual report is on the website and we publish one every year along with our audited 990s and you can see all about our finances and we are rated by top charity raters and often when people want to donate to the organization they'll do a little research on that organization so if people go to uh, these charity raters they will find that we have a good standing and of course we're part of the u.s government's combined federal campaign and I think my time is up and I'm ending just on time. And the last one is, here's Carla. She is your go-to person for chapter um, whatever you need at the national office. And just spread the word, make sure that everybody subscribes to, re to receive the HLA news. It's free, it's chock full of information and you get our news blasts and just spread the word. So I'm going to uh, invite my family now to all talk in my family room and ask questions or make comments. I would just love to hear some of your thoughts. Oh, and here's a great slide too. You gotta show that one. I just wanna say thank you. Did I hit that one? There we go. Thank you to our members, our volunteers, our donors and supporters across the country. And this is your HLA, it's, it's your organization. It belongs to all of us and we are a big community. And here's some California people and I see some Rochester people at the top and I see some Wisconsin people at the bottom. So I'm gonna now turn this over to whoever's moderating the questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara. This, is, this was fantastic. I didn't know all that we were involved with. This is marvelous, absolutely marvelous. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome. There's more, Katie. I just couldn't fit it all in 30 minutes. I know, we made you cut it off at 30 minutes. I know. <laughs> we'll have to have you back and you can go over more. We can do that. We can do that. Um, I would like to introduce Sarah Oser. She is president of our North Bay chapter in California. She's going to moderate the questions and answers. It's smoky up there too, more so than down here. But before we do that, I believe, Carla, we have a poll. Carla, do we have a poll? If you would please answer this, do you think HLAA has responded well to the COVID-19 crisis? Yes or no? Alrighty. And I'm sorry, trying to get to the polling. Okay, and the response is yes, overwhelmingly. So. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Sarah, I'm passing the baton to you. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Katie. I will now call on people to ask questions. Please put your questions by raising your hand in the participant section in your, the lower part of your screen. When you're called on, please unmute yourself. So the first person will be Judy Freeman, and after that, Carol Agate. Judy? Hello, everybody. It's so, always so wonderful to participate in these virtual meetings. They're just wonderful. Uh, I was very interested to get Barbara's further opinion uh, and some further information about clear masks. So what you said so far was extremely helpful and partially answered some of my questions. But my main question is, that seems like the type of thing, even aside from the fact that they're not yet uh, protective enough for medical purposes, but what about for everyday purposes, for people all over the world? Why is that not universal? Because there would be so much better communication uh, 
life would seem just a little bit more normal if everyone wore clear masks, and especially the clear mask, I saw one that has no borders. It's clear completely around the face. So do you know, can you explain, do you have any idea why the clear masks are not more popular? Is it because they are less protective than a two-layered cloth mask? Is it because they are less breathable than a two-layered cloth mask? So uh, I, I'm hoping you can answer those two questions. Yeah, that's, that's boy, you make, you make a great point and a great question. I, I'm just gonna give my personal opinion. First of all, I think most of the world doesn't even know about clear masks. Um, it never dawns on them because have we ever seen them? You know, we have because we live in this world where we need them. But um, I just, in fact, gave one to my neighbor who was going to visit her dad who wears hearing aids. And she goes, I've never seen one of these before. And she was so thrilled to get it. I wore my completely clear mask. I got it on Amazon. It covers like this, this part of my face. I wore it to my doctor's office for my physical a couple weeks ago. And he immediately dismissed it. He said, oh, that's not as protective as the two layer cloth ones with the filter or the medical one that he was wearing. And he didn't really give me an answer why, but he thought it was a really neat idea. I just think first awareness, most people don't even know about them. And it would be great if everybody were wearing them, you know, if the grocery store clerk were wearing them, if our neighbors were wearing them. And I do think there has to be more studies into the protective gear, what can protect us. And if you think about COVID-19 really exploded at the beginning of March, and there's still so much that we don't even know about the disease. Like if you get it, are you immune? I heard you're immune for three months and then you can get it again. You know, and so I think clear masks are just thrown into that mix of what we don't know. But I think the best thing, I think it was a big step when the CDC put that on their website and at least made people aware of them. I think some of our chapters have taken on the clear masks as an advocacy project in their communities to create awareness. But I don't think I really fully answered your question and I'm not sure I know the answer, but I would open it up to anybody who has any more information on that. I just. Uh, do you think they are as breathable as a two-layered cloth mask? I have no problem breathing in mine, and it does fog up. But another hint I got was like scuba diver's mask. If you put dish soap on it and then dip it in water and dry it off, it doesn't fog up as much. But I also wear glasses, and when I wear a regular mask, my glasses are fogging up. You know, I think masks are here to stay for a while and it's really important that we wear them and how we're gonna cope with them is, it needs to be answered. Um, I'm gonna put in my two cents worth on that. It also has to do with not everybody's breathing is the same. I mean, California right now has the fires we're definitely prone to this smog. But look at all the people who have breathing issues like asthma and stuff like that. Two layers does not, isn't the same ease of breathing as one layer and then three layers and the list goes on. So it's not as easy as just straightforward. Right. Okay. And the, um, we have a lot of questions here. I wonder if we could move on to the next person, uh, Carol Agate. The, um, the ADA requires auditoriums to have assistive listening devices or some method of um, access for people with hearing loss. But uh, Zoom has in effect taken the place of auditoriums. So why doesn't Zoom have to provide access through captions? I realize the organization that's using Zoom should rarely ever do they. 
I know the political campaigns, the rallies and fundraisers and lectures and things they're having. Every single time I ask them if they're going to be captioned, I'm getting nowhere with that. Why aren't these things being captured when they're, when they're on Zoom? HLAA is... Allison, I lost the last part of you, but I, I lost the last little bit, but I, I, I'm sorry, I think I got, I, your, was, I got your question. Was, was all that missing? Oh, no, no, I got, I got the oh. question. I, mass, I, I missed just a little bit of the last. And you ask about Zoom, and this is the new auditorium, you're saying. Of course, the and ADA the, just, just covers, um, you know, HLA public spaces. HLA does it, why get other organizations? Exactly. Well, there's a couple reasons. There are lots of, uh, there's laws on the books for captioning on the internet, for captioning on TV. And I think we just need to create more awareness and demand. Now, Zoom is doing beta captioning, or they are beta testing captions. In fact, they were doing this before the pandemic they were beta testing captions for Zoom. I think it's a matter of time. Like everything that happened in the pandemic, it happened fast and we're just trying to create awareness. And Microsoft Teams, which we use in our office, has captions. And this is automatic speech recognition. And to our great surprise, about a week ago, the caption function disappeared. And we didn't know if it was us, we called our IT people, but it seems to be something happening with Microsoft. So I think Zoom will come along. As I said, they, they've been beta testing the captions. There are some, uh, we've had some webinars on some automatic speech recognition apps that you can use along with your Zoom meeting. A, um, a lot of people are using Otter or Ava. Um, then there's the Ava Scribe, but o Otter is free. So I think it's, again, just we're gonna keep working on it and it's awareness. They know about the, the demand, I believe. And like face masks, like everything else, I think this is the new world we have to evolve into. That's a great question. All right, our next questioner is Heather Lair, followed by Lynn Johnson. Heather? Hi, um, Barbara, thank you for being here. This is so much fun. Um, I have had something that I've run into a number of times that I've never noticed that um, is on the HLAA radar and was wondering if maybe we don't have people helping out with this. I often ask for accommodation um because of my hearing loss and often like actually i'd have to say 99 percent of the time people say oh fine yes we'll get you a, a, a sign language interpreter or constantly it happened to me when i was in the hospital i would say you know i'm deaf and i need you know you know to face me and then suddenly a sign language interpreter would come every single time i was in the hospital and i'm like listen i don't speak sign language and only an infinitesimal amount of people. I think I saw the um, statistic that only 3% um, of all of the hearing loss communities um, can speak sign language. So I, I don't wanna like go against deaf people, but I do feel like there's this, this preponderance of, of people thinking that as long as I, um, do sign language interpreting, then I've met my ADA requirements. And right. I would very much like just to argue sign language isn't good at what we should be wanting because even deaf people can benefit from captioning. So right. the captioning benefits everybody. So is there some kind of movement to, to change this perception and how can I help? That's a great question, and it's really another hot button issue. You know, it's been 30 years since the ADA was passed, and hospitals fell under the ADA for communication access. And at the time, uh, Rocky Stone, our founder, was on the access board. And if it weren't for Rocky, 
This is the board that wrote the regulations for the ADA. If it weren't for Rocky and all of you across the country who sent in your input of technology you needed, there would be just sign language in the ADA. 30 years after the ADA, we are still fighting for accommodation in medical settings, right? Because I think, first of all, there's a great misunderstanding. You say you have a hearing loss or you're deaf. Oh, we'll get a sign language interpreter. We know what that is, right? It's an easy fix. But if you have a hearing loss, it might not be so clear. Do you need captioning? Do you need some assistive technology? What do you need? So yes, we are doing something about it. It's a big problem. We have a hospital toolkit on our website and that has a lot of good information. But we also have some volunteers now working very uh, diligently and focused on hospital access. And we, um, you know, we, we don't have anything to report yet on, on where that is, but we have a possible partnership with a big hospital. And I think there's somebody in um, Seattle doing some work with the hospital, but it's definitely on the radar and it's a huge problem. We found that during the pandemic, that when people had to be, um, go to the emergency room or hospitalized and they, they often, you can't bring somebody in with you because of COVID, that they would use a lot of uh, speech to text apps, uh, especially with the face masks. And that was helpful, but you know, it's not the answer in the end. I'm not really talking about hospitals. I, I, I'm, I, I'm mostly talking about the idea in hospitals and schools. I can't even tell you where they feel that that um, their requirement is to give you an a, um, interpreter, a sign language right. interpreter. And, and if you want something else, they don't have it, they're not interested, and I have to ask and I have to give them the information. So I feel like HLIA really needs to start pushing this idea that, you know what, sign language interpreting doesn't, doesn't cut it. We need captions. Everybody needs captions. Captions helps everybody, even the deaf community. Right. And all, you know, all we have to do is go back to the law, the ADA, and there is more in the ADA than sign language interpretation. Now, there are some people who use sign language who don't want to use captions because they understand in American Sign Language, and that's fine. They should have their reasonable accommodation, but we should have our reasonable accommodation of what works for us. So it's in the law, and that's what we have to go back to, but the problem is it's really up to the individual to request it, and then you might have to educate them and then advocate for it. And you know, everybody doesn't have that in them, you know, depending on the energy of the day, uh, how much you can do. I mean, it would be just wonderful if, I mean, we have so many stories of people who are, who are called to jury duty and they say, I'd love to serve and I would like captioning. Well, what's that? We, we think maybe we'll pass you over and pick another juror. Well, it's our, our right, it's our civic duty to serve on a jury. And why should you be denied that? Because somebody at the court doesn't understand what we need. So we're working on it. Okay, thank you. But Heather, you, you hit the nail on the head. You really hit it on the head. Okay, our um, next question comes from Lynn Johnson. Hi, everybody. I just wanna say, Thank you. I, uh, I just so happened to be reaching out and I came across the website and I saw that you were having this webinar. I have not been associated with HLAA, but I am so grateful for everyone who put this together. The information is so good. Uh, it's so encouraging. I just want to, I really don't have a question. I just wanted to encourage everybody to tell them, thank you so much. I'm dealing with hearing loss and I was trying to reach out and connect to the community. So my question is, how do I get involved? I um, 
to go on the website and looked around some things, which is how I signed up for the webinar. I'm in the Southeast Pennsylvania region. And I did um, so see that there was a chapter next to me, but how do, you, how do I get involved? I noticed that um, with my hearing loss, I am an advocator. I push like my local church to make sure they, they had a uh, assistant uh, listening devices, but I, I just want to say thank you all. I feel so encouraged, but how do I get involved? Lynn, I just want to say thank you. I am so excited. That's, that's who we want to reach is somebody who doesn't know about this, is surfing the web and finds us. And thank you for, for signing up today. And thank you, California, for doing this. Um, how can you get involved? Well, first of all, join that local chapter. There's a contact person there. And those chapters um, in Southeast Pennsylvania are really great chapters. I don't know which one you're close to. They also have a walk for hearing that's held in Philly. Are you anywhere near Philadelphia? Oh gosh, it yes. is, that walk for hearing is so much fun. It's held at the Navy Yard. And if you just want to go out and smile and see all those kids and all those families and people with hearing loss, get involved. Now this year, this fall, it's going to be a virtual walk because of the global health situation. But we hope to return soon to our walk days, which are just so much fun and there's so much support. And Lynn, you will never feel alone at a walk for hearing. Never. In fact, I hope you don't feel alone at this virtual meeting. And um, thank you for coming. And I think I just want to thank the organizers for doing this because look, we found Lynn or she found us. And that's great. Thank you. I'm so excited to meet you. Thank you. Our next I ask question. A question. What's a virtual walk? Oh, that's a good, <laughs> Wendy, that's a great question because when the pandemic hit and we had all these walks, we were sitting around and said, we're going to have to do a virtual walk. And then we said, what is it? How do we do it? Well, what we do is, um, and anybody, because they are virtual, go to walkforhearing.org and register for any one of them. I mean, they're coming up all this fall. They're in New York City. They're in Philly. They're in Boston. They're in Buffalo. And I'm sorry if I'm missing your city. Oh, Washington, D.C., sign up for one and it'll be like a big zoom meeting and there'll be some activities it won't be long it'll be about 35 minutes 40 minutes and then there'll be the sharing at the end so there also is people will have teams and do fundraising like they do at a regular walk but if you're not in that city or you know you don't want to get involved in that way just tune in tune in for those 35 minutes and enjoy them. They, they really are a lot of fun. And I'll see you on there because I'm at every one because they're fun. We'd like to take one last question. Uh, we do have more questions, but this is what we have time for. Uh, Les Greenberg, could you unmute yourself? Sure. Thanks to everyone. Thanks for California for setting this up and for all the people who are running it. My question is about the masks, not the masks, but the full face uh, plastics. Do you have any information on that for us? I really don't. I, I saw somebody in the chat box, I think it was Nancy Lake Ellis, who said that those are not approved for, um, you know, protective gear, but those, those are great because you can see your whole face. But there's gonna to have to be a lot of work done on face masks because they are here to stay. And you know, they, they can muffle the sound up to 25 decibels. So then you add in the six feet of social distancing, it's really a problem. Perhaps I said it wrong. I don't mean mask itself, but just the full face where it goes a band around your head and then you've got yeah. the welder's face mask. Yes. I, I, as I said, I saw in the chat box, I think it was Nancy Link Ellis from California who said that those were not approved for protective gear. Well, um, let's see, John Wallo says, some clear face shields, I missed the chat. But, um, you know, I know uh, my dentist wears a, a mask 
and a shield. The, I really don't know, Les. Do mm -hmm. I'll see if I can find something and then get it to you. That would be great. And we could share it with everybody. It was, thanks. Thank you everybody for your questions. Um, we're out of time for the questions section. So I'd like to hand this over to Carla for her poll. All right, one second. Okay. Okay, are you an HLA member? Yes or no, if you could please submit your answer, okay? Okay, and polling. Okay, and results are 89% are members and 11% are not. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah, very much for moderating our questions. I'm sorry we don't have time for everyone's questions. This poll is very interesting to me. I'm glad that so many people are HLAA members, but a part of me thinks also that we need to do a really good job of reaching out to people who are not HLAA members yet, people that don't know about us and that we can pull them in and show them what we have to offer. And on that note, I would like to hand this back over to Anne, Anne Thomas. Anne, where are you? And Carla, can you bring up my slide, please? So Barbara's done a really eloquent job of telling us all about the things that HLAA is doing for us. And the work did not stop during the pandemic. We had to learn how to do things in a new way. We had to learn how to host Zoom meetings and webinars. And we even had to learn how to participate in these events. Those are all new things for almost everybody. I value HLIA. I feel grateful from the bottom of my heart for everything that I've learned as a person with hearing loss by being a member of HLIA. There are power, there's power in numbers. The best thing that you can do for yourself and for the hearing loss awareness movement is to join us and make your voice heard. It's really easy to do. All you need to do is go to our website, look at the tabs at the cross, Pick the tab that says make an impact. A drop down window will open up. And in the left hand side in green, it says become a member or renew. Please, all you have to do is get your credit card out and it's done. <laughs> Please don't let it slip through the cracks. If you're not a member, if your membership has lapsed, some of us has lapsed, right? We didn't know what would happen. Those of you are 11% here today, it would be done and we welcome you with open heart. I guarantee that it's the best thing that you would ever do for yourself with hearing loss. I certainly know it's the best thing that I ever did. So join us today, go to the website. As soon as this um, webinar, this it's not a webinar, it's a meeting. As soon as this meeting ends, You'll be welcomed by all of us. Back to you. Thank you, Anne. Anne, in her meetings with us, with our chapter, with our chapter leaders, she does a really good job of being sure that every one of her chapter members is an HLAA member. I don't know how many chapters actually do that. So I charge all of you 
when you make contact with your chapters, be sure that everybody has joined because we can see all of the great stuff that HLAA is doing for us on a national and an international and our local levels. So ask them, bug them, talk to Anne if you have any questions about that. So in closing, I just wanna say that this meeting would not have been possible without the dedication and energy of all of my California chapter leaders and my virtual meeting committee. Ann Thomas, you're an inspiration. Your work and energy have been invaluable. Tony Barriant, you've been my ears and my support and taking the time to talk to me through issues and, and self-doubt and ideas. All of my California chapter leaders, thank you, hopefully for making HLAA California look good today. We have one last poll question for you. Carla? All right, one second. The last poll is, is how do you feel about your experience at this HRLA virtual meeting? Answer all that apply, please. It's not up. Okay. Okay. Alrighty, we'll share the results right now. 82% um, say we're informed. We're 77 percent connected. 62 are inspired. 63 are wanting more and 14% other. So I think it was a very successful meeting today. And I thank everybody's time today. And um, thank you, um, SHH California State Association for presenting this today and Barbara for taking her time today. And I thank you all for joining us today. I'd like to say one more thing. Sure. I would like to thank Carla and Derek, especially staff members for helping me and my committee put all of this together. Um, HLA also provided the Zoom experience and the cart for HLA California to be able to do this. If anybody wants information on how we put this together with just our group of California state chapter leaders, email us at info at hearinglosscalifornia.org. You see the picture on the slide and the address on the side. I'm hoping it goes in the chat. I'd like to thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon, evening for some of you. We hope it was worth your time. And I have to thank Deanna Baker for her wonderful cart services yes. as well. Yes. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.